the book of Genesis chapter 27, verse 29. Let people serve thee and nations bow down to thee. Be Lord over thy brethren and let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. Cursed be everyone that curseth thee and blessed be he that blesseth thee. All right, I want to give all praises, honor, and glory to Yahweh, Bahashem Yahweh Shai, Bahashem Rahakwadash. Yahweh is the true name of the Heavenly Father in the Holy Tongue. Yahweh Shai is the true name of the King and Savior of Israel. And Rahakwadash is the Holy Spirit, which is the Comforter. Double honest the apostles and elders of Great Millstone for leading by example in these last days. And Shalom to the hopeful elect. All you Aki are making your bodies a living sacrifice. Now through the Spirit, this is going to be a closer look at Psalms, the 83rd chapter. And this is a chapter brothers go to a lot. We bring this out to illustrate to you, Jakes, that you have an enemy. You have an enemy on this earth. When I say Jake, Jake is short for Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. You people of so-called Negro and native Indian descent, you're the 12 tribes of Israel, and you're the chosen people of the Most High, and you have enemies on this earth. The other 17 nations that are outside of the covenant, they're your enemies. We're not all the same, we're not equal, and the Most High most certainly does not look at us the same way. We have an enemy, and Psalms, the 83rd chapter, names them by name. It outlines them, and brothers bring that out time and time again, pretty much every week. And this lesson, I just want to go in the Psalms, the 83rd chapter, deep into it, because there's a lot of meat that deals with prophecy, that deals with recompense, that deals with the separation between the sons of the Most High and these heathen. So without further ado, let's get right into it. This is the book of Psalms, chapter 83, and we're going to start at the top. Keep not thou silence, O power, hold not thy peace, and be not still, O power. And that's the time we're in right now. It says, keep not thou silence. See, when you go into Ecclesiastes, the third chapter, it tells you there's a time for everything. There's a time to keep silence and a time to speak. And right now we're in that time to speak. When you go to, what is it, 2 Thessalonians 2 and 8, it tells you that the wicked is going to be revealed by the spirit of the Lord's mouth, which is the prophets. All right, the Lord has said prophets. Uh, let, me, let me get this real quick. We're going to come back to Psalms. This is the book of Isaiah chapter 62 verse 6 i have set watchmen upon thy walls o jerusalem which shall never hold their peace day nor night ye that make mention of yahweh keep not silence and give him no rest till he establish and till he make jerusalem a praise in the earth so we're in the time right now of the lord no longer holding his silence and this is it's beautiful that that's how that chapter begins because if we if the lord had kept silence this whole time we would never know who we are why? It's going to tell you in the next verse. This is back in Psalms 83, verse 2. For lo, thine enemies make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. The word tumult means confused noise or murmuring, an uproar. It says, for lo, thine enemies. And this is a key point right here. For lo, thine enemies. These other nations which we're about to read about, they're the enemies of the Heavenly Father. This is, this is Asaph talking to the Most High. He said, your enemies make a tumult. And they that hate you have lifted up the head. They have taken crafty counsel against your people and consulted against your hidden ones. Right, so this is Asaph speaking to the Most High. He's saying, these enemies, these nations that hate you, they've taken crafty counsel against your people. These heathen aren't just the enemies of the nation of Israel. It's important to understand. They're actually the enemies of the Most High. They hate the Most High because he didn't choose them. So... You jakes that have a problem with separation, with holiness, with being the holy people, with being chosen. You have low self-esteem. You have Stockholm Syndrome. This is deeper than your emotions. This is deeper than you wanting to save the heathen. These heathen actually hate the Heavenly Father. They despise our Father because he chose us and he put his name on us and he put us above all other people that are on the earth. When you read Deuteronomy 7 and 6, but this is verse 4. It says, they have said, come and let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Yasharala may be no more in remembrance. And that's exactly what they've done, man. They cut us off from being a nation, man. That's their inward thought is to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. Just the whole remembrance of Israel. Today, they're teaching you that the Israelites are so-called white people. They're so-called Caucasians. When those are the Edomites of the Bible, the Idumeans. When you read Job 9 and 24, it tells you the earth is given into the hand of the wicked. And what? He covereth the faces of the judges thereof. They've covered the faces of the judges, but it wasn't just the wicked. All of these nations conspired. Well, it's going to tell you in the next verse. 
for they have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against thee. So all of the nations came together in one mind, which that's what the word conspiracy means, one breath. Con meaning with or together, and spire means breath. That's the root word for spirit. So they're breathing together with one consent to cover the faces of the judges. It tells you in Isaiah 25 and 7 that there's going to be a covering cast over all people and a veil that is spread over all nations. This is a, a very serious plot, and it's so deep that when you go into it, a lot of people think it's crazy. That, why would all of the nations come together to conspire and hide our identity? Because they hate you. They hate the Most High. We just read in verse 2 and 3 that they lifted up their head against the Most High. They hate our Creator. So even though these heathen hate each other and they've been warring against each other, they hate us so much that they conspired to hide our identity. Why? When you go into Judith, the fifth chapter, it tells you that the heathen know as long as we sin against the Most High, the Most High is not going to be with us. And as long as we're at one with our power, none of these nations can come up against us. That's why the word atone is a compound word, at one, atone. We're atoning for our sins, which makes us what? At one with Yahweh Bashem Yahweh Shai. And these heathen know this. These heathen have our records. They have the archaeology. They have their records. Their records record King David taking down the heathen. Their records record the God of Israel delivering the Israelites out of various captivities. They know our history, man. They know our history better than a lot of our own people, unfortunately. So they've conspired together with one consent, and they're confederate against us. Now it's going to name names. Who are the enemies of Yahweh Bashem Yahweh Shai? and his people. Verse 6, the tabernacles of Edom. Now, who is Edom? When you read Genesis 36, around the 8th verse, it tells you Esau is Edom. These Edomites, in the Hebrew, Adawam, which means red, the red people. Today, they're known as Caucasians. They're known as Europeans, Americans, so-called white people. They're troglodytes. They're the Edomites of the Bible, which is I do mean in the Greek, and Edom in the English. It says the tabernacles of Edom. This is the first name mentioned when it speaks about the enemies of the Heavenly Father, which subsequently makes them the enemies of Yasharala. Again, you can't hate someone and then love their kids. You have a lot of our people that really believe that these heathen love them. How can they love us but hate our father? How can they love God's chosen people but hate God? That doesn't make any sense. If you hate the Most High, you're going to hate his chosen people. You're going to hate his creation. You're going to have a problem with what is, and you're going to try to fabricate your own synthetic version of reality, which is exactly what the heathen are doing. When you look at artificial intelligence, you look at uh, genetically modified foods, you look at this digital realm that they're creating. They're trying to take everything that the Most High created and replace it with this digital man-made madness that they put a patent on. Why? Because they don't just hate you, Jake. This is bigger than you. This is bigger than Harlem, okay? This is deeper than their hatred for the sons of the Most High. They actually hate the Most High himself. They hate creation. They hate the fact that the Lord made male and female. These devils are trying to create their own gender. They have a hatred that goes much deeper than skin color. You have to get out of this, well, I'm hated because of my skin color. We're, we're hated because we're black. No, these people hate the Heavenly Father and they hate his people. They hate his creation. They hate themselves. They don't even want to accept that they were created to bow down and serve the Israelites, which is why I open with Genesis, the 27th chapter. But it says the tabernacles of Edom and the Ishmaelites. Who are the Ishmaelites? The Ishmaelites are so-called Arabs. Arab is a byword. There's no such thing as an Arab race. The Hebrew word Arab means mixture. There are a lot of different nationalities that are considered Arab today, including Pakistanis, Indians, uh, Assyrians. All sorts of people are considered Arab. But this is naming the lineage of the people. It goes back to the progenitor Ishmael, who's the son of Abraham, but he was rejected. He doesn't have the blessing. It says, and the Ishmaelites of Moab, who is Moab? Today, the Moabites are known as so-called Chinese people. They're sons of Lot. And the Hagarenes, who are the Hagarenes? Hagar was the Egyptian handmaid to Sarah, all right, Abraham's wife. He had a, an Egyptian named Hagar that he went unto, and they created Ishmael. That's Hagarene is another way of saying Ishmael, but it's really a disrespectful term. For you to refer to someone by their foremother, every nationality in the Bible goes back to a man. When you call someone a Hagarene, you're basically saying, look, you're a son of Ishmael, but that doesn't even matter because you're the son of an Egyptian handmaid. You're the son of a slave. You're the son of a bondwoman. And they're not even counted as sons of Abraham, even though Ishmael is Abraham's firstborn son. When you go into Romans, let me get that real quick because... 
This is it's real disrespectful to call someone a Hagarene, but that's what the scriptures, this shows you the Lord isn't dealing with everybody, man. He doesn't even have a basic uh, modicum of respect for the other nations. He calls them Hagarenes. Now, why does it say that? This is the book of Romans chapter nine, verse seven. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Right. Just because you're a son of Abraham doesn't make you a son of the promise. It's going to tell you, verse 8, that is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of the Most High, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. Right. The children of the promise. When you go into Galatians 3 and 16, it tells you to Abraham and his seeds were the promises, but not seeds as of many, but seeds as of one, which is Yahweh Shai, which is also Isaac. So you have a lot of people that can't wrap their head around this. We're, well, aren't we all the children of God? Aren't we all the children of the promise? Well, no. Israel are promised the kingdom of heaven. The heathen are promised slavery. So, yeah, if you want to get super technical, we're all the children of the promise. But what did the Heavenly Father promise to each nation? He promised the nation of Israel dominance, the everlasting salvation, the covenants. Matter of fact, let's just go up while we're in Romans 9. This is verse 3. For I could wish that myself were a curse from Hamashiach for my brethren, for my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of the Most High and the promises. So all nations are promised something, but at the end of the day, only the Israelites are promised the kingdom of heaven, the adoption of sons, the glory and the covenants, the giving of the law and the service of the Most High. We're, we're the only nation that can serve the Most High. When you go into this... Uh, Romans 9 and 4, when you read it in different translations, it tells you the Israelites are the only people that can worship Yahweh Basha and Yahweh Shai. No one else can worship the Lord. They're going to have to worship us. And that's what's going to happen in the kingdom of heaven. That's why, again, it tells you that our blessing is for our mother's sons to bow down unto us. That's why the scriptures constantly refer to the heathen as thy mother's children, thy mother's sons. Why? Because your nationality is based on your father. But if your father doesn't claim you, you're a bastard. Why isn't Esau referred to as thy father's children? We, we come from the same father. We come from Abraham and Isaac, but they're called thy mother's sons. Ishmael, he comes from Abraham, but he's called what? A Hagarene. Why? Because his father doesn't claim him. Only Israel is acknowledged by the heavenly father. Everyone else is just thy mother's sons. That's why I open with Genesis 27 and 29. The blessing to the Israelites is to let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. It doesn't say father's sons, even though we come from the same father. They're not counted as our brethren. They broke the brotherly covenant. Do you understand how disrespectful it is to refer to someone by their foremother because their father was casted out? Their father doesn't even count. Your lineage is irrelevant. You're a Hagarene. Just imagine how disrespectful it would be to refer to an Israelite as a Rebecca Reen or a Rachelite or, you, you know, to refer to a nation of people by their foremother because their forefather was rejected and cast out. That's a, a huge slander, man. It's beautiful. And scripture says, and the Hagarenes, this is Psalms 83, and we left off at verse 6. This is verse 7. Gabal. And Gabal in the Hebrew goes into a chain of hills or a mountainous region. There's a Gabal in Edom. There's a Gabal in Phoenicia. Right? It says, and Ammon, which today the Ammonites are known as so-called Japanese people. The Ammonites and the Moabites are the sons of Lot. It says, and Amalek. Amalek is the head tribe of the nation of Edom. Today they're known as Israelis, so-called Jewish people. They're the imposters. They're the counterfeit Jew. It says, and Amalek. When you go into prophecy, the Most High said he's going to have war with Amalek forever. They're going to be in rulership in the last days. That's why the scripture tells you what? The first shall be last and the last shall be first. They're the most despised of the heathen. When you go into what? Uh, Obadiah. It says, the Philistines with the inhabitants of Tyre. And this is so-called Africans, Hamites. The Philistines, the actual Philistines are Hamites. When you go into Palestine today, you have a group of Ishmaelites claiming to be Philistines, man, which is crazy. If you ask any one of them if they descend from Ham, they'll tell you no. They'll look at you with a face of disgust, as anyone should. No one should be a descendant of Ham. But it shows you how mixed up and destroyed people are. You have a group of people that know that they're not Philistines, which are trying to claim uh, rightful ownership of the land of the Philistines, which that's our land. The whole area surrounding Israel is ours. The whole earth is ours. All you heathen belong to us. But this is verse 8. It says, Ashur also is joined with them. Ashur goes into the Assyrians. 
And it says, they have hoping in the children of Lot, which the word hoping means to seek strength from, to look for help. They've all conspired together with one consent to keep us down. And really, that goes back to the curses in Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter. It tells you that the heathen that is near you will get up over you. And they couldn't do this alone. They had to conspire together with one breath to do that. But this is verse 9. This is, this is the meat of the chapter right here. It says, Do unto them as unto the Midianites, as to Sisera, as to Jabin at the brook of Kison, which perished at Endor. They became as dung for the earth. Make their nobles like Oreb and like Zeb, yea, all their princes as Zabah and as Zalmunna. Now, a question you might have is, who the hell are these people? What is this talking about? As brothers say all the time, to understand the mysteries, you have to understand the history. So what is this saying in Psalms 83? Do unto them as unto the Midianites. Let's go back to, uh, let's go back and get some history. This is the book of Judges, chapter 7, and we're going to start at the top. It says, then Jerubbaal, who is Gideon. Now, Jerubbaal basically is like a title. It means contend with Baal. He was given this title by his father, who is Gideon. Gideon in the Hebrew is Gadawan. Gadawan is basically a, a warrior, a hewer. The word Gadai in the Hebrew means to chop down, to hew into pieces. So Gideon in the Hebrew is Gadaiwan, a warrior that chops people into pieces. All right. Who is Gideon and all the people that were with him rose up early and pitched beside the well of Harad so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Moray in the valley. And what's going on here is that this is a time during our captivity, one of our many captivities. But this particular moment, the Midianites were putting hell on our people and the Lord raised up Gideon as a judge. And it's a it's a beautiful story. We're going to read some of it because it's important to understand Psalms, the 83rd chapter. It's making reference to what we're reading right here. This is Judges 7 and 2. And Yahweh said unto Gideon, the people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands. Lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying mine own hand have saved me. And this is so powerful right here, man. The Most High is saying, look. I've chosen you to be the top judge in Israel right now. I'm going to send you into battle and you're going to win, but you're going to win because of me. So right now you have way too many soldiers. If you go into battle right now, you're going to think that you delivered yourselves. You're going to think that you got out of the situation because you were mighty. And right now, this is a time in history where we're completely outnumbered by the heathen. And the Lord is saying, look, you have too many soldiers. We're outnumbered right here in this verse, verse seven and two. We're outnumbered and the Lord is still saying it's too many. Send them back. Just, just let that sink in for a second. This is verse three. Now, therefore, go to proclaim in the ears of the people saying, whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. That's the spirit, man. I just did a lesson less than 24 hours ago going into how you're not allowed to be in a congregation if you're a coward. And this precept this is beautiful, man. It says, and there returned of the people 20 and 2,000, and there remained 10,000. What is that? The Lord got rid of two thirds and he kept one third. This is this is beautiful, man. This is our history. The Lord got rid of two thirds of Israelites and kept one third. This goes back to Zechariah 13 and eight. In the last days, the Lord is going to cut off two parts and the third's going to be left therein. And what, when you go into prophecy, the third that's left is going to be purified. They're going to be tried through fire. But what happens here? The Lord gets rid of two thirds and what's going to happen to this one third? Let's keep reading. Verse four, and Yahweh said unto Gideon, the people are yet too many. Bring them down unto the water. Bring them down unto the water, and I will try them. And I will try them for thee there. And it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, This shall go with thee, the same shall go with thee. And whomsoever I say unto thee, This shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. So we just read how the Lord did away with two thirds. He left the one third there, and now he's going to try the one third by water. Now let's watch what happens. This is verse 5. It says, So he brought down the people unto the water. And Yahweh said unto Gideon, Everyone that lappeth of the water with his tongue as a dog lappeth, him shalt thou set by himself. Likewise, everyone that boweth down upon his knees to drink. And the number of them that lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, were three hundred men. But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. Now, what did Yahweh say in Matthew, the seventh chapter? 
Give not that which is holy unto the dogs. Don't cast your pearls before swine. A pearl is basically a, a word, a proverb of great value, which is the scriptures. You're not supposed to share the mysteries and parables of the scriptures with dogs. And here in Judges, the seventh chapter, the Most High himself is likening Israelites unto dogs that don't know how to drink the water properly. If you don't know what to do with the water, you're a dog and you're not allowed to be a part of that holy convocation. The Lord is dealing with a small number, a little sanctuary, and that little sanctuary knows what to do with the water. And it's beautiful because this this is one of the accounts that shows how the Lord delivers his chosen people. And it's dealing with a great warrior by the name of Gideon. And too many Israelites were in the fold and the Lord just got rid of them, man. Why? So he could show his power and his might. Let's keep reading. This is verse seven. It says, and Yahweh said unto Gideon, by 300 men that lapped, will I save you and deliver the Midianites into thine hand and let all other people go every man unto his place. So the people took victuals in their hands and their trumpets, and he sent all the rest of Israel, every man unto his tent, and retained those 300 men, and the host of Midian was beneath him in the valley. And it came to pass that the same night that Yahweh said unto him, Arise, get thee down unto the host, for I have delivered it into thy hand. So what you're reading here is an account in the history of the nation of Israel, where the Lord separated one third from the two thirds and he brought the one third down to the water and he used the water to purify Israel, to basically distinguish between who he was dealing with and who he wasn't dealing with using living waters. And then what's the very next thing that happened? All the men that knew what to do with the water, they were given trumpets. This is a small army blowing the trumpet. After they consumed the water, they were given trumpets to blow. And when you continue reading down, it tells you that they used the trumpets to confuse the Midianites and they destroyed them. But I want to skip to the point so I can get back to Psalms. This is the book of Judges, chapter 7, verse 25. And they took two princes of the Midianites, Oreb and Zeb. Remember these names, Oreb and Zeb. We just read in Psalms, the 83rd chapter and the 11th verse, that the Lord is going to make the princes of the heathen, the nobles of the heathen. He's going to make them like Oreb and Zeb. Who are Oreb and Zeb? The word Oreb in the Hebrew is Arab, which means raven. The word Zeb in the Hebrew is Zaab, which means wolf. These are two princes of the Midianites. Now let's read what happened to them. It says, and they took two princes of the Midianites, Oreb and Zeb, and they slew Oreb upon the rock Oreb, and Zeb they slew at the winepress of Zeb, and pursued Midian, and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon on the other side Jordan. So both of these princes of the Midianites were beheaded. These men were decapitated, and their heads were brought to Gideon. Now we're going to get back to Psalms 83 with some understanding. Now that we have some history, it's going to shed light on this mystery. It says, this is Psalms 83, and we were at verse 11. Make their nobles like Oreb and like Zeb. So what just happened to them? We just read that they got decapitated and their heads were brought to Gideon, the chief judge of the nation of Israel at that time. And this preceded the deliverance out of the hands of the Midianites. And notice it says Oreb and Zeb. Let me get this real quick in Isaiah, because this, this is something that's, that's happened before and it's going to happen again. This is the book of Isaiah, chapter 10. And verse 26, And Yahweh, the Lord of hosts, shall stir up a scourge for him according to the slaughter of Midian at the rock of Oreb. So this is Isaiah bringing reference to the slaughter of the Midianites and Oreb. So this great deliverance is also likened unto Gideon delivering the chosen people. But what came before that? Let's go up to verse 22. For though thy people Israel be as the sand of the sea, yet a remnant of them shall return yet a remnant of them shall return. So again, when you go into Judges, the Lord started with a large multitude. He cut down two thirds, sent them on their way, dealt with the one third. The one third was purified and distinguished through the water. And there was a, a large multitude that was dwindled down into a little sanctuary. Now, right here in the book of Isaiah, the 10th chapter, it's telling you there's gonna be a deliverance likened unto the Midianites, but guess what? Before that deliverance, the Lord says what? For though thy people Israel be as the sand of the sea, yet a remnant of them shall return. Is that not what happened in Judges, the seventh chapter? Is that not what we're reading about in Psalms 83? It says, the consumption decree shall overflow with righteousness. For Yahweh, the Lord of hosts, shall make a consumption even determined in the midst of the land. Therefore, thus saith Yahweh, the Lord of hosts, O my people that dwellest in Zion, be not afraid of the Assyrian. 
He shall smite thee with a rod and shall lift up his staff against thee after the manner of Egypt. And this happened over a dispensation of time. You have the northern kingdom of Israel. They went into a, a captivity underneath the Assyrians, literally. But there's also a final Assyrian, a final Egypt, which is Babylon the Great. This is verse 25. For yet a very little while, and the indignation shall cease, and my anger and their destruction. So the indignation of the Heavenly Father against his chosen people is going to cease. But guess what? His anger is going to be to the destruction of the heathen. Verse 26. And Yahweh, the Lord of hosts, shall stir up a scourge for him according to the slaughter of Midian at the rock of Oreb. So this is all going to happen again. Everything we just read in Judges 7. We're... We're really at the part of the story where the living waters are discerning between who's worthy and who's not worthy. We're dealing with the 300 represents a small sanctuary of a great army. When you go into uh, all of these different movies and the depiction of 300, that goes back to the scriptures. That goes back to Gideon and his mighty men. And we're that through the spirit, man. The Lord is raising up an army of Gideon's mighty men. Now, let's get back to Psalms 83. Now that we understand what happened with Gideon, we have some insight of what this is talking about. This is verse 12 who said, let us take to ourselves the houses of the Most High in possession. Now, did they not do that? When you read 1 Maccabees 2 and 10, it tells you what nation have not taken part in her kingdom or gotten of her spoils. All these nations have carried away Israel into captivity. So guess what? The patience and faith of the saints. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. Every one of our enemies is going to be devoured. Verse 13, O oh my power, Make them like a wheel as the stubble before the wind. What is that wheel talking about? When you go into the Hebrew, this word wheel is Strong's H 1534, which is Galagal, which is a whirlwind, a tumbleweed. It says, O oh, Yahweh, make them like a tumbleweed, make them like a whirlwind as the stubble before the wind, as the fire burneth the wood, as the flame setteth the mountains on fire, which mountains are symbolic in the scriptures. Mountains represent governments or nations of people, but it's also literal. The chariots are going to set everything on fire. It says, so persecute them with thy tempest. What is a tempest? A tempest is a violent storm, a tornado, a complete, a whirlwind again, and make them afraid with thy storm. Now, what is this talking about? Psalms 83 verse 13 to 15 is describing the heathen being destroyed by a great tempest. This goes into Let's just get it real quick. This is, uh, there's so many, actually. Let, let's start with 2nd Ezra's. This is 2nd Ezra's 13, and I'm going to jump to 8. And after this I beheld, and lo, all they which were gathered together to subdue him were sore afraid, and yet there's fight. All they who? All the nations that were gathered together. These nations are actually conspiring to fight Yahweh Mashiach the king and savior of the nation of Israel, who these heathen call Jesus, which they know Jesus is an idol. They know that's not his name. They know he's not a so-called white man. They know Christianity is complete BS. Why? They're actually training to fight Yahweh Bashem Yahweh Shai. Now, we just read in Psalms, the 83rd chapter, that the heathen have lifted up their head against the Most High. They're the enemies of the Most High. They're not just the enemies of you, Jake. They're the enemies of Yahweh Bashem Yahweh Shai. They're in space right now, training and trying to put together a plan to fight the chariots, to fight the second coming of Yahawashai, which makes them what? Enemies of the Most High. What, what type of degenerate would plan an aerial assault against their own creator? A total reprobate, man, a loser. These heathen are complete losers. They're planning to fight Yahawashai Mashiach. Why? Because he's the chosen seed. He's the king of the nation of Israel. He's not for these other nations. He's coming back to put them in slavery, and they know that. They have, again, they have the history. They have our records. They have the archaeology. They know what happens when Israel comes into power. It's game over for the heathen. But it says what? And after this, I beheld, and lo, all they which were gathered together. What does that sound like? Joel, the third chapter. The Lord said he's going to gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Yahweh Shapat. All of them, man. All of these heathen that we read about in Psalms 83, they're the same heathen that are being gathered in the valley of Yahweh Shapat to do what? Uh, this is verse 9. And lo, as he saw the violence of the multitude that came, he neither lifted up his hand, nor held sword, nor any instrument of war. But only I saw that he sent out of his mouth as it had been a blast of fire, and out of his lips a flaming breath, and out of his tongue he cast out sparks and tempests. 
So exactly what we just read in Psalms 83, the Lord is gathering the nations and he's going to destroy them with a whirlwind, with a tempest. He's going to send down flames and a tempest. Let's continue reading. Verse 11, and they were all mixed together, the blast of fire, the flaming breath, and the great tempest, and fell with violence upon the multitude which was prepared to fight, and burnt them up, every one, so that upon a sudden of an innumerable multitude, nothing was to be perceived, but only dust and smell of smoke. When I saw this, I was afraid. Man, just picture that, man. Picture Yahawashai coming back on a giant chariot, and out of the chariot, there's going to be a blast of fire, a tempest, which is like a tornado of fire, and a laser beam, all of it mixed together. It's going to completely destroy these armies, man. World War III is going to be the most gruesome and really the final battle in the world, man. When you go into prophecy, there's not going to be war anymore in the kingdom of heaven. There's not even going to be weapons. All of the weapons are going to be destroyed. This final battle is the battle to end all battles. It's the war to end all wars. And Yahweh Shai is not even going to lift a finger. It's just going to be, let me read that again. And they were all mixed together, the blast of fire, the flaming breath, and the great tempest, and fell with violence upon the multitude which was prepared to fight, and burnt them up every one and burnt them up, every one, so that upon a sudden of an innumerable multitude, nothing was to be perceived, but only dust and smell of smoke. So imagine a group of armies gathered together. Yahweh Shai just pummels them and beats them in the dust. It's like that movie, uh, War of the Worlds, the alien would shoot. Esau puts this in his movies, but he has you believing that it's green men or little alien. No, that's Yahweh Shai and the angels, man. And it's not gonna be any victory at the end. Esau is not going to figure out how to hack the chariot. All of this, that's total madness. That's the vain imaginations of the heathen. What we're reading right here is what's actually going to happen. This was a vision given to the prophet Ezra. He saw it, which means it's already happened through the spirit. We're just going to watch it play out and it's going to be beautiful, man. This is back in Psalms. And before I get to Psalms 83, let me read this real quick. This is the book of Psalms, chapter 11, verse 5. Yahweh trieth the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. Right, Yahweh tries the righteous. We just read in Judges the seventh chapter, he tried the righteous through water. But right now, according to Zechariah 13 and 8, he's trying the righteous through fire. Our faith is being tried by fire through afflictions, the furnace of affliction. So it says Yahweh trieth the righteous, which he's doing, but the wicked and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. Upon the wicked, he shall rain snares, fire and brimstone, and a horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. So we just read in Psalms 83, we just read in 2 Ezra 13, that the Lord is going to destroy the wicked by raining fire and brimstone and a tempest down upon their heads. And when you go into Isaiah 34, well, let's just get it real quick. Uh, Isaiah 34, and actually let's start at the top. This is the book of Isaiah, chapter 34, verse 1. Come near ye nations. What nations? The same nations that we read in Psalms 83. The Most High, through the prophet Asap, named his enemies by name. Just imagine the biggest bully. He, he's like, look, I'm coming for you, Esau. I'm coming for you, Ammon. I'm coming for you, Ishmael. He's naming names, man. The Most High is not a rapper. He's not putting out a mixtape where he's talking about a man without saying his name. He's scared to do this. And that. No, he names names. Like, look, I'm the Most High. I want all the smoke. Literally, only dust and smell of smoke. It says, come near ye nations to hear and hearken ye people let the earth hear and all that is therein the world and all things that come forth of it for the indignation of Yahweh is upon all nations why because all nations are enemies of Yahweh Bashem Yahweh Shai all nations are against creation all nations are against the Lord's chosen people it says and his fury upon all their armies which we just read about we just read that his fury is going to pee upon all armies. And you can read the same thing in Joel, the third chapter, the second verse, and just read on down. It says, He hath utterly destroyed them. He hath delivered them to the slaughter. Their slain also shall be cast out, and their stink shall come up out of their carcasses, and the mountains shall be melted with their blood. Now, did we not just read in Psalms 83 and 14 that the Lord is going to rain down fire and set the mountains on fire? This is the same thing we're reading here. This is talking about the governments and nations of the different heathen. But this is, I'll just read four and five real quick because it goes into Psalms 83. It says, and all the hosts of heaven shall be dissolved 
and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll, which this is talking about a mushroom cloud, which can only take place from an atom bomb, a hydrogen bomb. The bombs that Isaiah is describing are also described in the book of Revelation, the sixth chapter, which is dealing with the destruction of Babylon the Great, where all the nations have gathered. It says, and all their hosts shall fall down as the leaf falleth off from the vine and as falling fig from a fig tree. For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Idumea and upon the people of my curse to judgment. And who are the Idumeans? Again, Idumea is the Greek way of saying Edom, these self-proclaimed white people. There's an end time prophecy of the Israelites being found in your hand and you're going to be destroyed by a weapon that's going to be bathed in heaven, which is talking about the missiles. It's going to come down upon Idumea and create a mushroom cloud, man. You can't get around this. This is beautiful. We read it in Psalms. We read it in Second Ezra. We're reading it in Isaiah. We can read it in Revelation. We could go all day with this, man. But let's let's wrap this up. Let's get back to Psalms 83. This is back in the book of Psalms, chapter 83. We read verse 15. We're at 16. Okay. Fill their faces with shame that they may seek thy name, O Yahweh. Let them be confounded and troubled forever. Forever. Yea, let them be put to shame and perish that men may know that thou, whose name alone is Yahweh, art the most high over all the earth. And that's what's going to happen. When you look at the deliverance of the nation of Israel out of Egypt, when the Most High destroyed Egypt, that name, Yahweh was feared, greatly feared. And subsequently, the sons of Yahweh were also feared. And as it tells you in Jeremiah 16, there's going to be a deliverance that's going to completely eclipse the deliverance in the past. There's going to be a new deliverance out of Egypt. So what does that come with? That comes with that fear of that name. You heathen are going to learn to fear the name Yahweh again. You know, it tells you in Malachi that his name is dreadful among the heathen. They don't like to say it. And very soon, they're going to be terrified when they hear us say it because they know what that comes with. Judgment, slavery, captivity, the patience and faith of the saints. It tells you in Isaiah that the nation and kingdom that will not serve us is going to perish. Those nations are going to be utterly wasted. And that's what we're reading about here in Psalms 83. And it's a, it's a beautiful chapter. It's an edifying chapter. And it's so much meat. You know, Abba Zadis was edifying to the elect. I want to give all praises honor and glory to Yahweh, Bahashem Yahweh Shai, Bahashem Rahakwadash, double honors to the apostles and elders of Great Millstone, and Shalom to the hopeful elect.